I went to the hospital when I was 12 years old. What I saw there has ruined my life. I was 12 years old when I was diagnosed with leukemia. I'm not sure that I truly understood that seriousness of the situation at the time. My parents certainly understood, and it showed me something that I had never before seen in them. Fear. I wish I had behaved better for my parents back then. Instead, when I learned that I would be staying in a hospital on the other side of the state for treatment, I threw a huge tantrum, crying, slamming doors, begging. Can't I just take the treatments at home? Why can't you stay at the hospital with me? I was a kid that always got cold feet at sleepovers and had my parents pick me up in the middle of the night. To say that I didn't enjoy being away from home would be an understatement. Looking back, despite all my tears and protests at the time, I really do believe that my parents handled it well. Finally, once I had calmed down, my parents, in the calmest tone that they could muster, explained that this was the only way for me to get better. That they would be here for each of my treatments, scheduled for twice a week, and that one of them would always be nearby. However, they couldn't be with me all the time, and the hospital wouldn't let anyone stay overnight. They told me how brave I was, and how proud of me that they were. And now I realize how absolutely terrified my parents must have been that I actually might die. And I was more worried about having to sleep without a nightlight. Fortunately, the doctors were extremely optimistic about my case. Apparently, I had been caught early and could be treated easily. That put my parents a little more at ease, but I was still tense about being away from home. Both of my parents came with me to my first treatment. I wanted to put up a fuss when the nurse told me to get undressed and put on a hospital gown, but I had already been lectured by my mother on the ride over about behaving for the doctors. After changing, I sat in a large vinyl chair while I was hooked up to an IV in a series of beeping machines. The exposed skin on my legs kept sticking to the vinyl chair and I wondered why they didn't have a cloth chair instead, but I realized that vinyl was probably easier to clean off blood and vomit. My parents sat on the other side of the IV and talked to me, trying to distract me from the mess of tubes and machines on the other side of me. I knew that the end of this treatment marked when I would begin staying at the hospital until my treatments ended, which I had been dreading for the last week. I didn't have time to dwell on it now, however, because as I sat there I began to get drowsy. Before I knew it, I woke up in a hospital bed, surrounded by darkness. It took a few minutes for my eyes to adjust to the dark. Some light from the hallway filtered in through the open door and large glass observation window next to it. At least I won't be alone, I thought to myself after my eyes had time to adjust. There were three other girls in my room, all sleeping peacefully in their beds. While I was somewhat relieved to have some company, I longed for the familiarity of my room at home. There was something about this place that put me on edge. Maybe it was the cold sterile atmosphere of the hospital. Maybe it was the low noises and whispers coming from outside in the hallway, or maybe it was just the darkness. I wanted to get up and run, to find a nurse and convince them, then let me call my parents and beg them to bring me home. After a second of fumbling around, I found the call button on the remote attached to my bed frame and I pressed it. A light outside the doorway to my room turned on, bathing the hallway in a deep red glow of light. With the light on, I realized that I could see into the room directly across from mine. Unlike the room I was in, the room only had two beds, both of which were occupied, though I couldn't tell anything about the people in them. Then I froze. Immediately behind the bed on the left side of the room, shrouded in shadow, stood a figure. It was extraordinarily tall, with its head almost touching the ceiling and long, slender body with thin, gangly arms. It looked like the figure was wearing a dark robe that hung awkwardly on its shoulders, with a hood covering its face. My heart seemingly stopped and pounded at the same time, and I was acutely aware of a ringing in my ears. The figure stood over the patient in the next room, possessively, 
like a predator over a fresh kill. Without thinking, I pressed the call button next to me again. The red light in the hallway began flashing off and on, illuminating the room across the hall for only a half second at a time. My muscles tensed and I felt my spine straighten and tense. I really wished that I hadn't pressed the call button at all, much less a second time. At first, the darkened figure didn't move. I stared at the figure with each flash of the red light strobing into the room across the hall. Then the figure tilted slightly, repositioning itself behind the hospital bed. Fear turned into outright panic when I realized what happened. The figure was looking back at me. Then, in brief, punctuated motions caused by the strobing effects of the red light above my door, the figure moved around the back side of the bed towards the door and into the hallway. I reacted the same way any other child reacts to fear. I pulled the cover over my head, trying to move as little as possible. My ears were ringing so loud that I thought my eardrums were about to burst. I felt like I was about to drown and realized that I had been holding my breath since I first saw the figure. Before I could begin to think about what else to do, a hand touched my head from outside the bedsheet. Instead of screaming, I could only loud a small, pathetic whimper. Are you okay, hon? A voice asked. I pulled the covers down just below my eyes and I saw a nurse in bright blue scrubs standing beside my bed. In my paralyzed state, I didn't realize that the red call light had been turned off and a small fluorescent light above my bed had been turned on. I think so, I said, voice quivering. I saw someone in the room and it, it looked like they were coming in here. Pointing at the room across the hall, there was a lump in my throat about the size of a golf ball. Well, that's surprising, the nurse replied, eyebrows raised as both those young men were in a car accident and are now in a medically induced coma. I don't think either of them will be walking around anytime soon. No, uh, not like that, I said, wondering how I was going to explain what I saw. My heart was still beating too fast to think straight. I think someone else was in the room. Like, standing by a bed. They started walking over here. Hmm, well... I didn't see anybody on my way here, and visiting hours have been over for a while now. Maybe you were just half awake and had a strange dream. Your medicine has been known to do that, you know. Maybe, I said, realizing the nurse would never believe anything about what I just saw. And I didn't want to push it anymore and be labeled a problem, lest my parents come and lecture me in the hospital bed the next day. I could feel my hands gently shaking, and I'm sure the nurse could tell that I was a nervous wreck regardless of whether she believed me or not. Before the nurse left, she helped me in my mobile IV bag to the bathroom in the front corner of the room. On the way out, I glimpsed into the hallway. Other than a long, dimly lit corridor softly buzzing with fluorescent lights, there was nothing. To say it gave me the chills was an understatement, though. Even though I wanted to return to sleep that night, I couldn't help myself from staring into the next room and vigilantly watching for the dark figure should he return. I met my new roommates the next morning, and they seemed nice enough. Brianna and Kayla had the beds on the opposite wall from me, and to my left, between my bed and the wall, was Sadie. While Brianna and Kayla were both close to my age, Sadie was a bit younger, probably eight or nine. Similar to me, each of the other girls were receiving chemotherapy treatment at the hospital. As Kayla proudly talked about how she would be going home soon, I could see Brianna's face stiffen. I did not sense that her treatment was going particularly well, and definitely did not have the heart to ask her about it. Fortunately, a nurse came in to take Brianna for some scans, saving us all from an awkward situation. Between scans... Blood draws, finger pricks, vomiting, sleeping, visits from my parents, and trying to eat whatever the hospital was trying to pass for food, I almost forgot about the dark figure that I had seen the night before. That was until Nurse Johnson sent my and the other girl's parents away for the night. Then, at precisely 10pm, the lights shut off, leaving only a few gently illuminating the hallway and at the nurse's station. Everything felt so much safer in the light. 
Despite being treated for leukemia, I felt like there was almost nothing to worry about with the lights on and people bustling around, filling the rooms and hallways. Now, only a few faint hallway lights fought off an aggressive darkness, desperate to engulf the few remaining islands of perceived safety. In bed, my mind wandered back to the dark presence that I saw yesterday. I would never had scary dreams before. I don't know why the medication would change that. Maybe it was making me hallucinate instead. Or maybe just a shadow from a piece of furniture in the other room combined with the medication made me think I saw the horrendous figure. But if that was the case, then how did it move? No one warned me of how exhausting treatment would be. Even with my mind in a flurry, I was quickly fast asleep. I don't know what exactly woke me up, perhaps it was a nurse passing by or a machine doing its usual beeping, but it was still quite dark when I blinked open my eyes. I was still half asleep when, without thinking, I turned my head towards the hallway. There it was again. The tall, slender figure was in the same place as last night, looming over one of the patients, almost engulfing the poor man with darkness. I shut my eyes shut as hard as I could, desperate to not draw its attention again. Don't look at it. A soft voice whispered behind me. My mind blanked in panic for a second before I realized that it was Sadie in the bed next to me. Don't look at it, she said again. Look over here. Slowly, I rolled over onto my side so that the hallway was to my back, taking short, shallow breaths in an effort to keep quiet. Having the figure behind me didn't really feel any safer, but I guess a repeat of last night probably wasn't smart either. It won't hurt you if you don't look at it, Sadie whispered again. What is that thing? I asked, finally opening my eyes. A monster, she replied before quietly rolling over and facing away from me. How do you know it won't hurt us? I whispered back to Sadie. She didn't respond and I decided to not push my luck and keep quiet. Though I did spend the rest of the night desperately hoping that Sadie would turn back over to talk to me. I don't know how she went back to sleep with that thing in the next room. For all I knew, she didn't. At some point, the lights flickered on in the hospital ward. It was 7 a.m., I cautiously rolled over and peered into the room across the hall. There was nothing there. Before I got the chance to talk to Sadie, the nurse came and led me down the hall. Treatment day again. The treatments, like before, knocked me out for several hours. But right before lunch, when my parents and everyone else was away, I finally had my chance. Sadie, what is that thing? I asked, desperate for an answer. Sadie cautiously looked around the room and lowered her head, only speaking in a whisper. Shh. It can hear us. It can hear everything. Can it hurt us? Does it want to hurt us? I asked. Please. It, it won't hurt us. As long as you leave it alone. Don't look at it. It almost came into our room because you wouldn't stop staring. Sadie was surprisingly assertive with her words, especially for a child. I wondered if her first experience with the figure had been similar to mine. How do you know this? I replied. Who told you all this stuff? Kayla and Brianna can't see it. Only us. Don't talk to anyone about the shadow man. Why do you call- I was cut off from my question when our nurse, Nurse Johnson, walked in. Diana? We need to do some more scans this afternoon. Are you ready? As I shuffled out of the room with Nurse Johnson, I looked back at Sadie. She was already looking away from me, pretending to not be paying attention. Her responses to me had been so short and firm that it made me feel small and pathetic in comparison. Or maybe everyone just reacts to fear differently. But I did realize that there was no way I'd get her to say anything else about the Shadow Man. That night, I felt safer in a way. If Sadie had been here longer than me and could see the Shadow Man too, then maybe she was right. Maybe if I looked away and pretended it wasn't there, that I would be fine. 
The figure had seen me, but hadn't tried returning to my room. Surely that was a good sign. In the middle of the night, I felt nauseous. Grabbing my AV bag to stand, I moved myself to the edge of the bed and got up, shuffling over to our room's small bathroom. I kept my eyes locked on my feet to avoid looking in the room across the hall. I knew the shadow man was there, though. I could feel his presence, and everyone in my senses was on high alert. I tried to steady my breathing, taking long gulps of air and releasing them slowly. The lump in my throat had returned, and I did my best to ignore it and focus on taking small, soft steps towards the bathroom. But then I stopped moving and stood as silently as possible when I heard a noise. Beep. 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 The noise was coming from across the hall. From the front of the room, I turned and slowly leaned my head into the doorway. I squinted, trying to see through the darkness. It took me a second to fully understand what I was seeing. The shadow man had a hand, or what looked like a hand, ashy and scaly with long pointed fingers gripping tightly on the comatose man's arm. For a second I spied the shadow man's face hiding under his black hood. It was skeletal looking, with only a thin layer of skin covered in black sore-like blotches. His eyes were pure white, locked onto the poor man below. I don't know how long I stood there staring at the shadow man. The shadow man kept an intense grip on the man's arm while the heartbeat monitor beeps increased to a desperate pace, and then the monitor let out one long, continuous beep. I could hear a team of doctors and nurses rushing down the hallway, but it was already too late. I honestly don't remember what happened to the shadow man at this point. For all I know, he may have simply vanished. In all the commotion with the doctors yelling orders and machines buzzing and beeping, I might have just lost track of him. But I do know one thing. The shadow man killed that man. Fortunately, I didn't see the shadow man again for a while. Don't get me wrong, for the next week I was paranoid that it would come for me next, but the hospital kept chugging along. Indifferent to what had happened, I kept going to my treatments and taking my medicine. My parents were with me every day. The doctors even praised my progress and assured me that I was getting better. With all the medication, however, I couldn't really tell much difference. I guess that's how most people feel if all they did was sleep and vomit. Kayla and Sadie got better too. About a week after I last saw the shadow man, Kayla was declared to be in remission and went home. And then a few weeks later, Sadie too went home with a clean bill of health. Brianna, however, was not doing so well. She had been moved to a more intensive unit down the hall, where she could be monitored more closely. On days that I didn't have treatments and was capable of staying awake until 10pm, a nurse would take me over to Brianna's room to spend some time with her. I couldn't tell you that we were friends exactly, but I expect the doctors thought that having support from someone who wasn't her parents around might help lift her spirits. Even though I was somewhat less worried about the shadow man, I always kept an eye on the clock to make sure I was safely back in my room before the lights went out for the night. For all I knew, the shadow man was long gone, but I didn't want to take that chance. Ten weeks into my treatment, I had gotten up to use the bathroom in the middle of the night. Even though I hadn't seen the shadow man again, I still always kept my eyes on my feet as a precaution. Fortunately, the nurses had left me some medication that I could take for nausea, so I got up much more infrequently than my initial treatments, but the changing dosage of my chemo treatment sometimes still made me ill at the inopportune times. While I was staggering towards the corner bathroom, eyes firmly on the ground in front of me, I saw movement out of the corner of my eye. I couldn't stop myself from looking, despite what I had seen weeks earlier. Maybe it was my nervous system in its weakened state was just trying to protect me. Reflexively, I turned myself and peered over the towards the doorway. In it stood a tall, 
slender figure, wearing a dark hooded robe. Pai recognized the pointed fingers and the skeletal, sore-ridden face. Shadows seemed to surround the figure, almost like it was sucking the darkness in towards itself. I don't know why I didn't panic this time. Maybe I was too dumbstruck to scream, or maybe my body was just too exhausted to react. But the shadow man didn't come towards me, as he did all those weeks ago. Instead, without warning, the shadow man slowly turned to the right without moving his body, seemingly levitating, until it faced the long hallway. Then he began moving, smoothly and silently down the hallway. Instead of thanking whatever god would have me for this near miss and getting back into bed, I sheepishly stepped out in the hallway and watched the shadow man continue gliding down the hallway, darkness following him from every available room he passed. Suddenly the shadow man stopped. With the same ghostly movement he turned and entered a room at the far end of the hall. Brianna's room. Foolishly I made my way down the hallway towards Brianna's room. I don't know why I decided to follow the shadow man as I certainly didn't want to watch him squeeze the life out of Brianna as he had done before, but I, I, I couldn't stop myself as Brianna was after all, my friend. It felt like a lifetime making it to the other end of the hallway, but I imagine it took only 30 or so seconds. A healthy person could probably do it in five. My heart was pounding by the time I reached Brianna's doorway. A mixture of desperation, fear, and fatigue. Looking through the doorway, I confirmed what I had suspected, but I hoped it wouldn't be true. Standing possessively behind Brianna's bed was the shadow man. I couldn't muster the energy to scream or run away. Instead, I just stared at the figure and, after a minute or so, realized that I was crying. Tears gently ran down my face and chin, and mucus ran down the back of my nose to my throat, but I didn't budge. I couldn't leave Brianna here alone with this monster. The shadow man slowly raised his head, breaking his gaze from my friend, and fixed his stare towards me. His soulless white eyes connected with mine, and then, solemnly, the shadow man nodded towards me, ever so slightly. But here's the odd thing. It didn't feel threatening, or harsh, or even scary. Instead, it felt... sympathetic. Like that nod you do at the funeral when you don't really know what to say. A subtle acknowledgement of your suffering. A voice behind me broke me from my trance. What are you doing out of bed? Nurse Johnson said, somewhat impatiently. She softened her tone as soon as I turned my head and she saw the tears running down my face. Oh, honey, it's alright. Brianna is going to be just fine. Come on, let's get you back to bed. As the nurse took my arm to lead me down the hall and back to my room, I glanced back into Brianna's room. The shadow man was gone. I laid in bed the rest of the night wondering what to do. Was there even anything that I could do? Was I putting myself in danger? Sadie had apparently thought that even seeing the shadow man was too dangerous. Other than tonight, I had thought the same thing, or maybe he was going to come back for me. The next night, despite being horribly tired from the night before, I waited until the lights in the hospital had been out for a few hours, and rolled myself out of bed. I made my way down the hallway quite slowly, still wondering if I was making a huge mistake for putting myself in the shadow man's sights yet again. I had almost convinced myself that I had passed the point of no return when I made it to Brianna's doorway and peered in. Except the shadow man wasn't there. I stood dumbfounded for a minute. Nothing in Brianna's room looked out of the ordinary. I turned and looked up and down the hallway. Nothing. I stood for another minute, confused. The shadow man had hung around the first patient every night until he died. Why would he leave Brianna alone after such a short time? I realized this was a weird question to ask myself as I was essentially wondering why the shadow man hadn't killed my friend. 
As I walked back to my room, I peered into every room, looking for just a glimpse of the shadow man. Nothing. I went back to my room, repeatedly going over the same question in my head and eventually drifted to sleep. I went back to Brianna's room every night that I was still in the hospital. It became a nightly ritual. I'd get up, look out the doorway for any nurses that would reprimand me from being out of bed, and shuffle down to Brianna's room. As I would get closer to her room, my heartbeat would quicken, and the hair on the back of my neck would stand up. Sometimes I felt like I was being watched, but that was probably just paranoia. Surprisingly, Brianna began to get better. Her parents claimed it was nothing short of a miracle. I considered telling them the truth about everything that I saw. Not that they would believe me. I would only cast a shadow over what they thought was their daughter's miraculous recovery. I continued to get better too. I was in the hospital for five more weeks until one day my doctor walked into my room with my parents and told me that I would be going home soon. I knew this day was coming eventually, so I was hardly surprised. But there was a small part of me that wanted to stay, to see if the shadow man ever returned. I guess a normal person would have left and never looked back. Life went on. I went back to school, had birthdays, got my license, and went to college. I occasionally thought about the shadow man and whether or not it was just a weird hallucination that I had when I was under extreme amount of stress. The older I got, the more I convinced myself that he couldn't be real. Or so I had hoped. After I finished college, I packed up my things and moved to the city. I had a job, a boyfriend, an apartment, and a cat. I guess you could say that things were going well. After a childhood of treatment and reoccurring cancer scares, I felt like my life had finally begun. One week, I was sent out of town for a week for work to help finish up a big project my team was working on. I could have weaseled my way out of it if I truly wanted to, but the truth was, I liked when work sent me places. It made me feel important. I had asked my boyfriend to stay over at my apartment to watch my cat and keep an eye on the place. He was quite fond of my cat and watched her before, so I thought everything would be fine. About halfway into my stay at the other office, I was woken up at around 3am by my phone buzzing on the hotel stand next to my bed. Groggingly, I picked up the phone and I looked at it. It was my boyfriend. What could he possibly be doing awake at this hour? I thought to myself. I dreaded answering the call, but knew it would keep me awake for the rest of the night if I didn't. Nothing good can be on the other end of a line at this hour. Hello? Hey. Sorry to wake you, but I didn't know what else to do at this point, Chris said, his voice filled with worry. I sat up in the bed, awake with anticipation of what he was about to say. What's going on? Are, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. It's actually Patty. She woke up an hour ago and just started hissing at the corner of the bedroom. She has her fur all raised up and her pupils are huge. I can't seem to get her to calm down. Has she ever done this before? What should I do? I sat there for a second, puzzled. I had gotten her from the shelter when she was a kitten and she had never done anything even remotely aggressive. I didn't think I had ever seen her hiss before. Chris was able to get her to calm down and away. When Chris left the bedroom and went into the living room, Patty followed him and hid under the couch. After a few minutes of trying to coax her out, I just told Chris to leave her alone and go back to bed. I assured him that something probably just spooked her on the outside patio and that leaving her where she felt safe was probably the best option. The next morning I called Chris as soon as I got done with work. He said, Patty seemed fine, but was still acting a bit strangely. He said that she seemed quite nervous near the bedroom and refused to get close to it, much less enter. This particularly worried me as Patty loved to snooze on the bed in the morning sun. I told Chris that I was flying home tomorrow after work and would be home late, but we could take Patty to the vet the first thing next morning. I called Chris the next morning on the walk to the office to see if Patty was feeling any better except there was no answer. I called again. 
nothing. Chris worked from home as a web developer, so not answering wasn't a big deal. He was probably just on call with clients and would call me back when he got the chance. Except he didn't call me back. I called again at lunch, then on the taxi ride to the airport. I thought about texting his mom, but knew that would become a hassle in itself. Instead, I called my next door neighbor and asked her to knock on the door and see if Chris was home. She called back ten minutes later. No answer. The whole flight back, I was worried. I tried to rationalize why Chris wasn't answering the phone, but everything I thought of ended up seeming ridiculous. The truth is, there's really no reason for Chris to not call me back unless something bad happened. Even if he had gone to the emergency room, I probably would have gotten a call from someone by now. I was in his phone's emergency contacts, for Christ's sake. I was nothing but a ball of tension when I finally made it back to my apartment. It was just a little after midnight when I unlocked the door and I brought myself inside. Every light in the apartment was off, so I fumbled around and was able to get to the hallway and the kitchen light on. From the kitchen I could see Patty sitting patiently on the couch in the living room. What's wrong, Buttercup? I asked in my cat mom voice as I walked over and picked up Patty. Patty sat in my arms and purred, closing her eyes. She certainly didn't seem like she was in distress now. Chris? I called out. Are you here? Why haven't you been answering me? Did something happen? As I walked over towards the bedroom, Patty began to squirm, more and more frantically as I got closer to the door. I put her down and she bolted under the couch. When I opened the door to the bedroom, I realized that all those years ago I was not hallucinating, no matter how much I hoped that I was. In the corner stood the familiar, darkened figure with the black robe, skeletal face, and icy white eyes. He slowly raised his head under his hood and met my gaze. Again he nodded to me, solemnly, and in the next instant he was gone, vanished. And there on the bed was Chris. Poor, poor Chris. I have been in therapy for six months now. I know that my therapist can tell that I'm holding something back, but what am I supposed to do? Tell her that I killed my boyfriend by unknowingly making a deal with a monster? I broke down in her office a month ago and told her that it was all my fault. I still didn't mention the Shadow Man, though. I don't want to end up in an institution. I'm sure she knows that I didn't literally kill him, but she does know how guilty I feel and is helping me work through it, which I'm grateful for. I decided to write down everything I remember as some sort of cathartic process. Halfway through doing so, I remembered my hospital roommate Sadie and it occurred to me that there must be others that have seen the Shadow Man, or at least have the ability to, like Sadie and I. And That's when I decided that others need to know what I've seen. So if you do see the Shadow Man, let this be a warning. Don't look at him.